interim meeting on January 19th. There we go. A reminder about the IPR policy, which this group abides by, and the policy is on the link here. And only people and companies that are listed on the site are allowed to make substantive contributions. So this is welcome to the first interim meeting of 2021. Uh, we'll be talking about insertable streams, a cropping control for media stream track, and some open issues from Weber to see extension. Uh, just one request, we're trying to schedule a February interim. So we have a doodle poll open. Please fill that out. The poll will close today. Um, so hopefully we'll find a time and date that everyone can come to, but please do fill it out. Right, a little bit about the meeting. It is being recorded, recording has been turned on. Um, can we get a volunteer to be a scribe? Somebody to take minutes about what we're about to do. Anyone? Yeah, I can do that too. Tom, can we? Let's get it. Okay, well, no, well I, thank uh, you. It's, it's an X here. Right. I can do it today. Uh, it's on IRC, right? Okay, you excellent. Thank you. Thing? Uh, I think ideally, yes. Okay. All right, here's the uh, menu for today. Uh, have insertable streams, uh, and then the cropping control and the Weber C extension stuff. All right, Harold, over to you. Okay, next slide. Uh, that's a slide. So that's a quick status report. There's really nothing to discuss uh, for the working group now on the, on the proposal for raw media insertable streams. We do have an implementation, so we have saw it working for video behind the flag origin trial thing as usual. We have uh, performance, I, I said, till the equivalent, well, within an order of magnitude at least, of production canvas based solutions. We're trying to beat them, but we're not quite, quite there yet. Uh, we, changes, we did some changes to the spec based on the discussion at the last meeting. I removed my stage two. So we only have a separate track processor and track generator objects. And in the, in the process of implementing it, we had a few changes uh, to the spec. Uh, I mean, we renamed track processor and track generator to media stream track processor and media stream track generator because just because we like, we like long names and polluting the namespace with uh, very unspecific names is a bad thing. And we found reason to add a buffer size argument to the track processor. We had a couple of things that we have not implemented. Audio, that is uh, almost ready, as, as uh, Gilles has uh, changed this in review. And control signals, where as going to change the proposed changing the names of the control signal tracks to writable control and readable control just because uh, having writable and readable for something that is not a transform is a little bit confusing so that's uh, that that will be spec updates i'll have more more to report on that in february any questions uh, okay. I have a question, Harold. Um, what do you think? Is there any spec, anything in the spec that would be needed to improve the performance beyond Canvas, or is this purely uh, an optimization issue in the code? Uh, we're trying to make it an optimization issue. We, I suspect that we might come might come back and and want to talk more about buffer handling because buffer handling is kind of right. the place where the rubber hits the Tomic, preventing takeoff, uh, whatever. And uh, so uh, we have we have to figure out first that this is indeed a 
a problem that we can't solve within a spec. And second, we have to come up with some bright idea, ideas for ma making this, for, for putting stuff in the spec that makes great things happen. So let's talk about that next next month and see, see if we have more ideas done. But I co-opted uh, this part of this uh, slot on the agenda for my other and current work, which is uh, what I call the next step toward the Lego laser. And uh, that is to this, the Lego laser is a reference to, a, 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 it's not even a sketch of an idea, it's more a sketch of a direction, which is to disassemble the, the RTP sender and RTP receiver into objects that can be used independently. And uh, it's kind of, uh, 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 a gradualist approach to getting the benefits that uh, ORTC seem to promise. So, next, sl next slide. Next slide. Yep. So, insertable streams on the WebRTC side is basically a wire out the side of the sender and receiver. Means you, you pick up two wires, connect connect them through your shift, and that handles the frames. And everything else goes on as usual. And that means that the only thing connection you have is these two wires. And the the piece you're connecting into is still connected on the back side. So when we had the discussion about breakout box, you saw my stage two and stage three, and everyone said, no, stage two doesn't make sense. Let's not do it, including the guy in charge of implementing it. So we, we said, oh, let's not do that. And so going back to insertable streams, it's kind of, yeah, the same principle should apply here too. So let's see if we can apply it. Next slide. So this is the change boxes model where you break the stuff that you're interfacing to into two parts and have all the connections between them be monitorable and modifiable by JavaScript. So in the breakout box, we said there's a channel of frames, there's a channel of feedback messages going in opposite directions. And these are the only two connections between the entities at each end. It's reasonably obvious that when you have encoded data, there's much more, more going on inside in, in terms of feedback signals, congestion controls, uh, uh, fra inter-frame requests and all that stuff that, uh, that is uh, going to hurt you if you don't do it properly. So there has to be a feedback channel. And the experience with, uh, with insertable streams is also that it, uh, really does not play well with SDP. I mean, if you insert your own encoder or encryptor or whatever, what comes out is not, in fact, what came in. And pretending that nothing has happened to it in terms of SDP negotiation is just wrong. It's it's causing trouble for us, and it will, will continue to cause trouble if we don't do it right. Next slide. So the first sketch of the API is uh, that you break up the sender class 
into two levels, the base sender and the RTP sender. Uh, it's called RTP, RTC, RTP sender because that's what it's called. We don't change the names of existing objects, we just redefine them a little bit. And then you can have a second class that is also an instance of base sender that exposes these streams. And so you can get those into the transceiver model by simply saying that the sender attribute is a union of these two types. It can be either one or the other. And of course, the same thing on the receiver side. Next slide. So on the sender side, we can add another call saying add frame stream, which will cause the pay connection to create a, a frame sender object rather than an RTP sender object, doing exactly the same thing as add track and similar modifications. And when receiving, we can do the same thing as we do with, uh, with data channels we tell the pair connection what kind of they what kind of receiver we want. So then you will get a, an on track, the other one with fire an on frame stream event that tells you, oh, you have a new frame stream. Go grab it. Of course, you have to do this per media type because it's likely that you only want to do this for audio, or only do, do this for video, or something, that, or you might want it for both. Next slide. So, when we have control messages, it seems logical to use that facility for saying, for letting the object you insert say, I want this kind of codec. And it can actually receive the same thing from upstream if you actually connect it to, to the track, where you can propose a codec, you can accept the codec. So once we have these pieces in place, and of course, the upstream piece that is not the sender that contains the encoder, or decoder has to be specified too. Instead of having a, a, a pair connection with a sender object, you have a pair connection with a frame sender object and a code encoder object and taking in the media stream up there. So you're decomposing our current model, but not changing it fundamentally, but decomposing it. Next slide. So one possible application that I talked to Tony with about is if we want to re rewrite the jitter buffer in JavaScript, that's a receiver side only. So it would take encoded frames as input because they're so much smaller, they're much easier to keep in a buffer and emit raw audio frames which means that the, the decoder is actually inside the JavaScript. So there are a number of, of challenges to this, including that audio jitter buffer requires that you deliver data every 10 milliseconds on the clock, every 10 milliseconds on the clock. And of course, doing garbage collection on uh, dynamically allocated buffers is a challenge when you're doing every 10 milliseconds on the clock. So that's an example of what you could do with this. Whether it's workable or not, well, we have to, we have, to have a design and uh, finish up and implement it and see if it actually can make, be made to work before, before we can say that. But it, I think it's worth trying. I think that's the end of, end of my, my speech. Comments, questions.
Who would own uh, like a buffer pool? What? Who would own a buffer pool? Would it be JavaScript or would it be uh, the platform? That's a good question. I don't know. I suspect that uh, we, we would need to say that there's a buffer pool here. Here's how you say that you take things out of the buffer pool and put them back in the buffer pool. But uh, I think there has to be a pool. And I think it needs to be available both to the JavaScript and to the native side. It's one of the challenges. I haven't worked it out yet. So this is more not a proposal I can implement from. It's, I think this is the direction we would want to go in order to break things up so that we can build the tools we want to do. Uh, so, also, you talk. Uh, say, go ahead, Jimmy. No, I was going to say, so I, I I like this, but I'm kind of nervous about some of the suggested directions. I'm particularly nervous about getting SDP in at that level. I, I think the data channel stuff is the ideas of using the data channel kind of arbitrary labels and that kind of style is much more uh, much easier to manage, and I, we get involved in far fewer standards battles that way. Which I think is a is a huge huge win. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd want to keep an eye on that. Um, I yeah, guess the, the problem, Tim, is is if you just encrypt stuff without telling anybody else, right? That's in Harold's point is valid. It's it's weird to just negotiate things and then well you know, not have any. Right, but the way that this works on the data channel is that you've got two clues. Like you, you, you tag the channel as with a protocol potentially, and you tag it with a label, and it's up to the far end to interpret that any which way they want. And the assumption is both ends have been written with the same same rule set, uh, but that doesn't have to be a public standardized rule set. Yep, wouldn't the that, same that, be that works for if you want to abandon the uh, the if you don't have an interworking requirement that works. Wouldn't be wouldn't it be enough to just let SDP rules negotiate the the mid and everything else just placeholder application specific, and then you don't need to worry about anything else, right? Well, uh, that that requires uh, the generic RTP and uh, encapsulation formats, and Bernard can uh, if you want to use RTP. I think you need you'd also need like some tag which would go along with it, which would let you know what you're expecting it to be. I don't think the mid is enough to like say what what the protocol is essentially or, or what the you know rules for handling it. You need some kind of arbitrary label or, or protocol tag or something as well, I think. Yeah, the, the, there were discussions in the past about being able to read and write RTP head extensions. So if you, if through SDP you negotiate a, a given head extensions and then you you control the values that are given for it, then you can have this kind of negotiation that is uh, more dynamic than with SDP. So I I struggle with some of the assumptions here that uh, we need a feedback channel for one. You mentioned congestion controls, inner frame requests, but this is all client side and, and JavaScript. So, um, and for possible applications, Jitterbuffer and JS is nice, but um, could you talk more about the, are there other applications for this other than that? Well, uh, once we have the APIs defined here, and doing things like repa replacing transports is pretty trivial. And I also want to go in and break break up the RTP module itself. And of course, uh, if you want to deploy a web codec, you basically have a, a new new codec with a web codec API. Then uh, then you certainly need exactly this interface. 
plus the raw interface. I actually put up a demo that uh, uses the raw uh, breakout box interface. Takes, takes a breakout box stream, pu pushes it through a web codec, and decodes it, and encode, decode, and push it back into a, into a raw stream. That works. It was trivial code. But uh, I need this side to be equally open before I can actually use that to build my, to get, to, to use all my building blocks. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a little hard to comment. Uh, it's, it's fairly um loose yes yes yeah it's very I mean, uh, very far from the from the from the net picking stage right if i were to nitpick on uh you know the the use of track names like bike shedding like names like track and stream is quite confusing at this point so, oh yes um, I mean, uh, that's... I, I mean uh, i'm trying to use stream only for the stuff that we inhale we, that we inherit from the stream spec. I'm trying to use track every time, uh, or media stream track. Uh, that every every time we refer to what is called a media stream track in in uh, in uh, get user media. So you're breaking out a new class for the sender to have a writable. Uh, but then the application example is for the receiver, so I'm assuming a similar API there. Oh, yes. Uh, I just didn't uh, write a slide for it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so some of the concerns I have is uh, this still feels like wires on the side a little bit. Um, and that, uh, and it sounds like we're we're uh, now we're back into encoded data, and there's other proposals with uh, raw data, and it's a little confusing. But it kind of seems like at, uh, we're trying to break up these APIs so you can get access to data, and the question is, what kind of class should uh, hold the representation of this data then? And um, we're building them in two places, in peer connection and in raw media. It seems like if we're able to ex crack open a media stream track on one end and expose raw media data, then perhaps a peer connection sender should be a consumer of that data. Instead of, we have seem to have plug-in APIs on, um, on both. So yeah, thing, I don't know the, which approach, the, yeah. Yeah, the thing, the thing is I, I want to have exposed the encoded form so that JavaScript can manipulate that. And I want to reuse the, the object definitions from web codec, which does expose an encoded form and a raw form. So, and I guess also for the feedback channel, how, how certain are you that uh, a stream is the best representation for that rather than methods? Because they sound like uh, a way for the uh, sync to control things about the delivery. I'm not sure. Um, uh, it kind of, how to say, when you have a stream, you have, by definition, an ordering. And uh, and so you, and so even though the operation themselves, uh, I mean, what I don't like about uh, operation style interfaces is that they implicitly have a return value, so they assume that you're looping down and coming back up, while when you're building streams, you are implicitly assuming that you have data going one way. And uh, having that be replied to 
actually requires more more uh, going outside the basic model. And I happen to like that model. I'm not sure it's the it, it's the I'm not hundred percent sure it's the, it's the best way, but I just happen to, to think that all the discussions we've had about asynchronous versus synchronous interfaces tend to show that the style of interface where you assume a requester that gets a reply is actually quite a complex model. So I'd like to try something else. OK. My last feedback then would be that this seems to focus on the API for setting up these constructs. And I guess I'm more curious about what the API would be for the JavaScript that you would actually try to insert in this into this uh, mix. Uh, for instance, you know, if there's a feedback channel, it would have to be some kind of protocol, I assume. Oh yes, it would have been. We have to. We would have to define define objects that are what is being passed on the feedback channel, and that requires more work for both our cases. I mean, it's interesting, but I'm not sure I'm sold on the direction. But uh, ah, learning more to... about those things that I mentioned might might help. Yeah, I have to work up, work on this some more. Thanks for the feedback. I think my final piece of feedback would be about let's not forget about web audio. Like giving these audio examples triggers me into thinking, well, actually, this would be something that would be nice to plug into the front end of web audio. And it looks like doing that is going to be quite clumsy. Well, it, it, it turns out that there's an, there's an interesting overlap there because web codec on the raw side has chosen a representation from representation of audio buffers that comes from web audio. So we're trying to not invent wheels too many times. So I'm hoping that we can can co connect these pieces uh, at least with a little bit of elegance. Cool. That sounds one good. Of my, one of my hobby horses is that I want I want to write more demos so that it, so that I can show that not only that it's possible to co connect these things, but it, that it actually works when you try. We had a demo that broke and uh, surfaced an important bug the other day, which was I think an excellent. Ex Excellent use of demos. So let's demo. OK, finish this slide. I think it's uh, Yuan's turn now. Yes. Um, so it's also related to the same area, I guess. I I'm still fuzzy a little bit about how um, the work you presented uh, fits in where it's in each of the streams. But anyway, um, so at the meeting in December or November, maybe, uh, we started discussing uh, going to a world where WebRTL server streams would be uh, defined as transformed. Um, so I presented half of, a demo, half, half of a slide. So here are the remaining slides. So just to recap, there's an ongoing safari experiment, which uh, basically implements WebRTC in stable streams using a transform model. So basically you add a transform attribute to sender receiver, and then you can uh, set transform like S-frame transform, which is pure native and implements S-frame, or you can have a script transform, which allows to uh, implement a transform in JavaScript in a world. Next slide. Yes, so me too. OK. Um, maybe, Aral, can, can you mute? It seems we have some echo. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, OK, so the questions that were raised uh, during the meeting were, uh, I remember, three, uh, three slides. Uh, first one was, 
how we expose, should we expose streams or frames? Uh, should we expose the feedback channel like uh, on the other side, like um, Harold mentioned? And also, um, it would be good to evaluate the API complexity. So I decided to go with some examples there. And uh, the goal is not really to, to look at uh, the API exposed in, in workers, but mostly to look at the API in window and see whether it can adapt and see whether it's complex or not. So the first example, next slide. Uh, so we, <coughs> we imagine that there's a script transform in window. And when you instantiate a script, window, uh, script transform in window, then there's a script transformer in our worker that is created. The script transformer is responsible to implement the actual transformation from frames uh, in a worker. And the script transform is there to allow the web page to control what's happening in a worker. So you create the transform, you assign, you assign it to the sender, then there's a port so that you can exchange messages between the script transform and the transformer so that you can send keys or whatever. And on the worker, uh, there's the creation of a transformer. So here I took uh, an event like on RTC transform, but it could be different things. That's not the, the point there. Uh, but what we can see there, um, so let's say that now we have the worker, the worker has a transformer. So the transformer can send messages back to the transform. We can say it has, it can expose readable and writable, just like uh, current instable streams. And you can do pipe through, pipe to, uh, just like you would normally do. And that's working. Uh, so there it's the stream-based variant. But of course, on the right side of uh, the slide, you can see that you can change a little bit the model there, uh, just on the worker API. And then, bang, it's frame-based. And it's sort of fine as well. So there's no, no longer readable or writable, but there's, on, for instance, an on-frame event. And you, you can do things, and you can write, and, and that's working. So it, it shows that um, the fact that we are checking stream or frame, we can decide later. Uh, but the transform model that we, that we apply there uh, can, can use both models. Um, in terms of JavaScript, it's very similar in any case. Uh, next slide. Slide nine. Uh, but, um, so slide 19. Example two. Yep. Um, so there, uh, I decided to go with another model. Uh, let's say that we have a script transform and we can only uh, uh, instantiated in a worker. And it's transferable because we implement the transform as a transform stream uh, as defined in uh, the web working streams uh, specification, and it's transferable. There, you can see that the uh, window HTML page uh, is very similar. You still have a transform attribute, you assign it, uh, and that's all. On the worker side, uh, you need to create an RTP RT script transform. It has uh, a callback called transform frame, which takes, uh, which has a difference in nature. It takes a frame and it takes a context. That's by definition of the transform stream in what what we would spec. Uh, the context is interesting because um, you, you need it to enqueue data like a regular transform stream, but we could also decide to extend it. So that for instance, you could get uh, information like betray, you could, uh, we could extend it to say, hey, I want, I want to request a keyframe. OK, let's, let's go for it. Um, the good thing there is that in example one, exa example two, we are seeing that it can be, um, it can be uh, extended. And if you look at the exposed API there, it's, it, it's not a big API. So in terms of complexity, uh, well, we, we just have one constraint there and uh, a few attributes. So it, it's smaller than the example one. It might be a little bit less flexible, we, we might say, but it's very up to us to design what we think is the right trade-off between uh, a bigger API, more powerful, and a simpler API, uh, less flexible, for instance. And next slide. So I'm back with example three with the transform transformer case. And uh, I'm looking now at whether we can implement 
implement feedback control. Um, so there you can see that the window API stay the same because uh, if you have feedback control, you probably want to have uh, knowledge of the feedback control when you do transform. So it's good to have uh, in the same place where you get data uh, to transform also the like the bitrate. And maybe you want to change the bitrate or you want to request a keyframe or like whatever. But you keep that at, at the same place in the worker. And there you can see that I'm adding a transformer on bitrate change, even for instance, if that's useful, maybe it's an event. Uh, it could be a stream, like it, it could be a readable control stream in the transformer, and then you can pull data from it. It's fine as well. Um, on the right, I added like transformer.request keyframe. It's a method, which means that uh, the encoder will do its best to uh, produce a keyframe as soon as possible, which might be nice in the case where, for instance, you are changing keys and you actually want when you change the keys to start with a keyframe. That's fine as well. Um, what we see there is that with the introduction, for instance, of a transformer uh, construct, but it, it could also be the context construct from the previous example, we have placeholders where we can extend APIs um, to um, expose knobs that might be of interest uh, to fine tune the transform or to fine tune a little bit what's happening uh, before the encoder uh, or uh, after in the network or vice versa. It's really, it's really up to, to us to, to do that. Um, but it, it does not change the, the model that we have a sender with the transform attribute or that we have a transform. Because the concept is really that you have data, you want to transform it, and you want to, to send it to, to the next step. And you might need a lot of information to actually do that. And it might come from the feedback control. It might come from uh, the window application. And we, we should make this API uh, as comfortable and as easy as possible to get all the data when you're doing the transform of the frame. So to conclude uh, the evaluation, next slide. So let's, let's look at the three bullets. We want to expose either streams or frames in workers, it's not yet clear. Um, the model that is exposed there can uh, can do both. Uh, it's something that we will need to decide, but it seems orthogonal to using transform there. Uh, we might want to expose a feedback channel. It's unclear yet, but we might want to. Uh, this model allows it. You can expose a readable control. You can expose new methods. You can expose events. It's really up uh, to us. The, the, the main thing here is that we keep it close to where we're doing the transform. And in terms of API complexity, uh, the proposed window interface is quite quite simple. You had, uh, like for doing S-Frame, it's S-Frame transform, and then you have uh, these uh, uh, transform attributes. For the GS, the script transform, of course, it's more powerful, so we will need more constructs. Uh, but given the examples, it seems that we can really either decide to go with a few constructs or more constructs. Um, it's really up to us, but it's, it doesn't seem to be, uh, like the transform model does not seem to be uh, refraining one or the other. Based on that, next slide. <coughs> I'm wondering what the working group uh, consensus is, and I, I'm making a few proposals there um, and seeking feedback from the working group. So the proposal one would be to adopt transform-based API in Windows environments. So that means basically add this uh, attribute. And proposal two would be to adopt this frame native transform, which has been identified as a really important use case. So we, we should do it sooner rather than later. And the proposal three is to continue API design for script transform. Um, we identified a core set of features for simple transform, like the S-Frame transform. So we, we at least need people to be able to build something like S-Frame native transform with this API. And we are also identifying uh, possibilities for more than that with uh, the feedback control. And that's something we should uh, continue digging. And uh, we can probably build on that and add uh, APIs progressively. 
feedback questions yeah um i like this direction i think um the <clears throat> the script transform object uh, you mentioned uh the two options there for whether you create the transform on the worker or you create it on the main thread is an interesting one because it addresses a core problem they have, we have with all these data. It's, it's too much data to do on the main thread. So we want to make sure we make APIs that make it obvious that uh, since the control uh, surface is on the main thread where you hook all this up, uh, it would be good to have an API where people don't accidentally do the wrong thing. And um, I like the approach uh, maybe it's a bit redundant to have a, a port and stuff like that to communicate it, but, uh, but I like the API that it guides you to do the right thing. <clears throat> and that by, uh, I like where you create the transform and you have to specify a worker, makes it clear that this, has, this is called a main thread and uh, it's separate. So it, it includes a separation that I like between uh, control on main <clears throat> and data on the worker. So I really like that. Um, and as for proposal one and two, yeah, I, I think we should do that. So I'm a, I'm kind of uh, I like proposal two. I mean the S frame native transform and what we can do when we have a native transform is kind of compelling to me. Uh, what I am nervous about is uh, adopting the trans uh, an API that says that you can only use transforms. In particular, since I believe that we we want uh, we we have applications that will want to use the four port model of the of tra transforms. I mean. In out, in out. That's four port, four ports. Well, the transform we have sketched out so far is it's only two ports. It's only uh, one one way through. So I'm nervous about adopting the the tra transform base as our only only API as a yeah. as an optimization API over uh, that is uh, quicker to to call than. Uh, Connecting the streams, I'm fine with it. And uh, I do agree with proposal three. We have to continue the API design. As I said earlier, I'm I'm very nervous about uh, continuing to specify all our APIs in in, the, in terms of functions. I think it's a I think it's a model that has proved problematic. We have to we have to get a handle on feedback control. We have to have a, get a handle on on uh, how to configure, how to tell the next step what to expect, how to query the next step for what it is expecting, and uh, that's more or less in, independent on, on of the API model actually. So, yes to the native transform. I'm uh, hesitant to adopt, to say that we should adopt the transform API. So, going back to your point about the transform, uh, which is uh, two ports, and you might want at the end to have four ports. Um, Currently, in one example, we have uh, the transformer, which has a getter, would be, which would be readable, and another getter, which would be writable. So we have two ports. Uh, we could certainly add another getter, which would be readable control, and another, which would be writable control. And then you have the four ports. So it's, it's really at the next step. So it's really in proposal three, but we will identify with a two, or four are needed. Currently, I'm not sure, uh, but I, I don't think. I think it's independent from proposal one. 
uh, whether we will expose feedback control or not, and whether feedback control will be exposed as streams or as functions or events or what whatever um, other API. So that's why I'm, I'm not nervous about um, adopting uh, an attribute which would which will be transformed because at the end of the day, uh, it's just uh, a switch to say, hey, uh, I want something. I want to customize something. So uh, give me the context uh, with all the APIs where I could customize things, and that's what we will define. And we'll define the context and all the APIs that allows to do the full customization. So uh, what I like about the transform is that it seems uh, easy to do the same things, but harder to do the wrong things. So with insertable streams, I do worry that uh, it's not clear how you're supposed to connect the pipes together. And there are ways to connect them that uh, could cause a lot of weirdness and might require a lot of extra tests and undefined behavior. So. Uh, and, and if we have an S-frame native transform, we still have to answer, well, how do you add that to your sender? Meaning, so, uh, uh, meaning that I, I'm also for proposal two, and I, uh, but I think we also want proposal one. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, I like the direction of this, but it's hard to comment without seeing, like, how would you achieve exactly the same thing but with the uh, existing API surfaces, would you do the same thing, but transfer, you create the transform objects on the main thread and then you transfer them over to the worker or, or how does that work? Correct, you, you, will, you, will, you will get the readable and the writable streams. You will create a worker and then you will call post message with the readable and writable uh, to the worker, and then you will do like uh, the readable pipe through pipe to uh, dance in the worker. So that's how it's done currently. Um, I can like there are examples that are doing so, uh, and that's fine. Um, there it would it will be uh, done from the start, so you don't have to do that dance. And the other thing is that with the current API, you have a readable writable. So if we add new APIs, like oh, I want to request the keyframe, then you will probably want to uh, call request the keyframe in the worker, not in the window environment. So we will need to transfer this object that allows to request keyframe to the worker. Or we will need to add this API in readable or writable, and so on. So, so that becomes more difficult. While if we have a transform with clear objects in worker and in window, in worker we'll be able to expose. Uh, we have a placeholder for exposing various kinds of APIs, which is very very natural. Yeah, I I like the whole the, the I like them inherently living where they're supposed to live, and I think you've shown that this can be extended to add more things without having to add additional hops later. Uh, what I like is, if I understand correctly, you're exposing readable and writable only in the worker and not on main thread. Is that right? That, that's one option we, we need to decide. Uh, but but okay. certain, that, that's fine. I'm fine with it. Another option would be to uh, add frame events. Like you have an event for each frame, and then you have an API where you can write the frame. It's, it's also doable this okay. way. Um, I think what, what I was hoping is, is to not expose I think ideally we would not want to expose readable and writable on main thread. Yeah. At all. I agree. Uh, to avoid people doing that, because people will do that if we if it if we add that, and sure. that would be performance would be terrible. So I, I again I think this is a good direction. I'm kind of fairly happy with it. I think the only thing again looking at web audio that we see with. with See behavior we see in web audio is that you have multiple um, listeners to a an output. So it, the the kind of one in one out model isn't true for web audio. You have like seventeen things out, and 
I can see uses for that. I mean, it's obviously there are uses for that in audio, but I think there are some in video as well. So uh, it would be a shame to if the strict transform prevented you from doing that. Maybe there's some kind of I don't know, fan out transform or something you can apply. You, you can certainly do that if uh, the, the frame is clonable. If you can clone the frame, then you receive a frame, you transform it, you send it back, and then uh, before sending it, you clone it and you post message it to another worker that will do something. It, it's really up to the JavaScript. So it's really the definition of the RTC encoded uh, image or frame, a video frame, uh, will tell us whether you can do that or not. And we can certainly decide outside of this proposal to make it happen. What you'd want to post message it to would be probably another transform or another thing that would normally be a consumer. So it really is a, a fan out type action. You, you can certainly, um, for instance, if, if we're exposing streams, you can, uh, very double stream, you can, um, you can clone it, you can tee it, uh, that's the term, and then yeah. you can uh, transfer it. If you, if we are exposing just frames, then you can create a readable stream that is in JavaScript that takes the frames uh, in it. You can then T the readable stream and send one and keep the over for your own business. Okay, That's cool. also doable. Yeah, I think that'd be nice to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So I had one API question. What happens if I uh, assign the same transformer to two different sender.transform? So currently in a Safari implementation, uh, it will fail. You uh, okay. will reject, it will, uh, for an exception. Uh, I think Harald mentioned in the past whether it's fine to allow a sender transform to be overwritten. Like you have the first transform, you assign it, and then you reassign it to a new fresh transform. And this we should discuss either to uh, for an exception or to allow it. And this will uh, basically, um, this will tell us how we uh, specify uh, the transform, whether we will do pipe two, uh, for instance, or whether we will do, uh, we will put data and send it. Um, but we can achieve both models as well. Is the transformer reusable after the stream has been uh, stopped, closed? Um, so currently, if the transform, if the transform is uh, assigned to a sender or receiver, it will not be reusable. Uh, okay. I do not see huge value in that, and it was simpler to implement it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But no, yeah. That, that has been my experience, too, dealing with readable, writable streams, is that when you set up these pipe chains, uh, you imagine, you know, it's you always have to create new objects. It seems like, yeah, uh, because uh, they're only good for that uh, that round. Okay. Would that make sense? Thanks. Okay. So, so what's the conclusion? Do, do we get consensus on, on this proposal? So um, I'm in favor, and I heard some other voices in favor, I think. Are I th there I any uh, objections? I think you definitely have uh, support for going forward with making a specific proposal, yes. But um, it, it, isn't it a specific proposal there? I mean, I mean uh, a pull request towards a pull request. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. I'll do that. I mean, getting getting it to be that specific is probably yeah. It will take right. some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. And I'm and I'm certain to re-raise all my worries when the pull request comes <laughs> because then it will right. either be obvious <laughs> that I'm wrong or it will be obvious something else will be obvious. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, next. Okay, can can we just uh, write it down in the meeting? Then there is consensus to go forward and propose a pull request. Uh, uh, 
can we can we be clear in the minutes which what our action items are with respect to proposals one, two, and three? I think the proposal uh, the, the goal would be to provide pull requests for proposal one, then pull requests for proposal two, and for proposal three, it's too early to make a pull request. Okay, I think, uh, Alad, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so um, I would like to uh, make a suggestion uh, for introducing cropping, uh, make a cropping mechanism for midstream track. Um, not you, of course, any kind of bike shedding if it's on midstream instead or something like that, uh, that is okay for me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm, yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, here I've been filled in uh, that probably I'm not the first one that's introducing a proposal to make some kind of video or photo editing, uh, adding some kind of capability like that in the browser, and that such, such proposals have been met with some resistance in the past uh, because it's a slippery slope and we never know what when uh, this might stop, and a lot of those can be achieved there otherwise. And I would like to say that in this particular case, I think that I've got an argument. I cannot tell if it's new because I've not been here in the past, but I hope that it is new. And I'll present it uh, with the next slide, please. Uh, so first, I would like to claim with absolutely no authority that there is at least this part of the mandate of the browser. Uh, the browser needs to allow applications to run and uh, they need to be able to do uh, all sorts of things. And if it's a reasonable task, it needs to be a, uh, an application needs to be able to do it well. And furthermore, good applications make implicit guarantees to the user. Uh, and if an application cannot make a good guarantee to the user, and that guarantee is very reasonable, uh, then the browser needs to make it possible for the application to give this, that guarantee. So next slide, please. So I want to claim that if we have this for a following application that presents slides to users and also lets them see this, the local user can see the remote user's video feeds while sharing their own tab or at least part of it to uh, remotely, it could be that the application wishes to uh, promise the user, hey, you've got some private content here, speaker notes, your name, your address, all sorts of things, uh, but we're gonna crop that away. Now, this is a guarantee given by the application and communicated by the application, right? Uh, so each application is going to communicate uh, that fact differently and there will be different things. In this example, we can see that there is uh, some, uh, there are some things on the screen which are not really privacy sensitive, right? That's the nature of this mock, but we still don't want to share them remotely. Namely, uh, the video feeds from the remote participants should not be shared uh, back to them. But you can imagine imagine this mock also with a couple of speaker notes that the speaker produced for themselves. Um, and I would like to claim that right now, uh, this cannot be cropped away so easily. Now, there is an underlying assumption here, uh, and the underlying assumption is um, that get this tab media slash get current browser context media or one of the other names has already been accepted. We're still debating how it should be accomplished, but we've kind of accepted that it needs to be accomplished, that we need some kind of a get this tab media interface, in which case the application already knows that it's getting its own tabs media, which means that it knows where it wants to crop, but that's a bit difficult uh, to do in JavaScript as I want to, uh, to show. So next uh, tab, slide please. Um, so, when the window uh, gets resized and things get shifted around because of that, or if you zoom or scroll or any other variety of uh, things that could get the uh, part of the browser, which if I'm not mistaken, is called the compositor, to rearrange things in the, on the screen, um, that's a problem. Because if it were up to the application to crop, then it wouldn't really know for each given frame that it gets, was this produced before or after such a resize? 
because an, uh, an event that, hey, resize happened, gets posted back to the event loop, and that's not synchronized with the uh, composition and drawing of the frame and capturing of it. Uh, and to further complicate things, um, first, it could be that the application is uh, spends multiple frames, which means that even knowing where anything on the screen is, could be a matter of posting messages in between. So it's even more difficult. And to further complicate it, it could be that there are peer connections involved, which means that if you, uh, it's actually likely in this particular case, uh, use case, uh, and if you make a mistake, if you miscrop something, then before you realize your mistake, that frame is already on the wire and about to embarrass you to your colleagues. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So I want to, uh, quickly look at three non-solutions and then look at the solution that I recommend. So the first non-solution we've just discussed, it's like on resize event uh, handlers. You know, by the time that you uh, handle the event, might be a bit too late. Um, so we cannot use that so long as we're using peer connections. Next slide, please. Uh, now you might say, okay, uh, you could hold on to the frames that you are just about to send, make sure that no, if, uh, no uh, event happens, uh, no on resize event, no on zoom event, etc. Hold that uh, frame for a while and then transmit it after, you know, you could, for example, have a barrier event where you post to yourself. And if you see that by the time that event you've just posted to yourself comes up again, no such event happened, you know, okay. Um, I don't think that's a good solution because that would, by the, uh, design, introduce delay, which is not something we generally want. Uh, and there are other problems, but um, that's enough. Uh, next slide, please. Another non-solution, as far as I can tell, is request video frame callback. And we can see that um, it, if I understand correctly, it gives a best effort kind of um, uh, a best effort service. But even if it were to give the guaranteed service, uh, because you need the because the content can be between different frames, which are cross origin, it would still, I think, not help because you would still need to post an event. It's gonna be, uh, well, it would still be problematic, uh, but it is best service. Um, next slide, please. So I want to say that uh, once we've uh, looked at these possible solutions, we're kind of left with two general approaches. We can say, Either, okay, so your problem was that you were still capturing while there was a resize going. So how about as soon as you there is a resize or a resume or whatever, get the, uh, make sure that the browser pauses the, uh, the, the capture, notifies the application. The application then gives the new coordinates, uh, calculates the new coordinates, says, okay, everything's ready. And then it resumes the capture and that capture can get paused again. Um, that was my initial approach. It ended up uh, spiraling out of control in terms of complexity. I could go into that if it's necessary, if anybody's interested, but I don't think that's a good solution. Uh, the other approach is to say, okay, the browser is going to do the, the cropping. And of course, uh, this also involves a lot of other uh, side effects. For example, it probably is going to be a bit more efficient. Uh, it's much easier for an application to use. Uh, it's not a bad solution in my humble opinion. Um, it's got one problem. Um, the application needs to communicate in some way, okay, here are the, here's the general area I want to capture and I need to capture it even if it gets resized, moved, etc. And to do that seamlessly. So I think that the best thing is to say, okay, here's a div, whatever is inside I want to capture or everything, anything that's outside of it I don't want to capture and whatever the current coordinates at any given frame are, just capture that, and the browser can do that. There is only one problem with that, and that is that if the div happens to be on a different frame, uh, which is cross-origin, then it's a bit difficult to refer to that, and I've got a solution to that too. Next slide, please. Um, if we could jump one more slide, and then we'll go back. Uh, one more slide. Yes, thank you. So uh, in this code sample, very minimalistic, you can see that there is uh, the very last uh, code line is MST crop two. Normally you would expect that to be the actual div passed in. I'm saying instead, 
let's just use some kind of uh, string based ID. And if that string and that string based ID is obviously serializable, which means it can be used as post message between frames, which means if we go with that solution, any fr uh, code in any frame can, given user consent, capture uh, uh, and crop to content in any other um, in any other frame. So we maintain uh, a high uh, degree of flexibility. Of course, still, like if you want to capture, you know, two quarters of a frame, might be a bit difficult. If it, but you understand. Uh, one uh, step back, please. Uh, thank you. So to summarize, what I'm suggesting is that given that we already have video uh, of the current tab, so basically if the media track, um, the media stream on which uh, this API is operating, if you try, if it was uh, received in any way other than calling get current display media, I'm sorry, get current browser context media or get this type media, it will just fail. But if it was obtained using that API call, then the application already knows that it is of the current tab. So we're not clicking any information by not failing. So only then do we actually work. And on such media streams, we can say, OK, please drop to this particular div. And the div you reference using uh, an ID. And that's pretty much it. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just to walk through this code example, so um, a div can um, define a crop ID. I'm perfectly uh, fine using any name you would like. Uh, the uh, idea is that we probably don't want to overload the current ID or something like that and give it because they might not be unique across frames, et cetera. And then we just define a crop ID. That crop ID, obviously, you'd only need to specify it on something that the application actually knows it wants to eventually crop to, so any other would just not have it. Uh, then um, you either, then you get it programmatically or hard code it or whatever, pass it to whatever frame which uh, is to actually uh, run the capture, possibly your own frame. And you just call uh, the media stream track dot crop to, again, name up to debate. And then one last thing that I think would be up to debate is whether we want to make the ID kind of uh, an unguessable token. Uh, or if we want to say it's up to the application to maintain uniqueness, if there are several, uh, uh, they could randomly choose it, but they could also hard code it to whatever they want. Uh, I'm guessing that unguessable token would not hurt anybody, but it would also uh, mean that whatever kind of security implications we might not be able to think of uh, would be, uh, it would be a bit better for that. Um, it would be harder for the for developers to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, but that's, I guess, one of the least important parts about my suggestion. So uh, I'm done talking. I, I have a question. So I, I like I like being able to uh, uh, get a track that only contains what you want it to contain. And I think all the non-solutions are, are suboptimal. They, they I don't think they work. I do think I do think you you need to be able to tell the browser to to do this to fulfill the use case. But I, I'm wondering why uh, this is as a separate step, right? Because it looks like you're capturing it in one track and then you are cropping it in a separate uh, step. And I'm wondering if you could simply do in the argument to this tab media, you say you, re you reference the div element as an object reference directly and then the capture only capture that you never you don't capture and then later crop you simply capture what you want to capture right from the start and the media stream track only contains what it should contain so you don't have this intermediate step um, would that be possible? Uh, yes i'm open to that possibility i thought that it would be a little bit less user so it's got both benefits as well as uh problems uh one problem is that then you cannot switch uh, the crop region, which is an, something an, an application might wish to do. I don't think that the one that I'm specifically building this for needs that. So I would be perfectly open to that, but it's up to you. On the other hand, it is good that the application then doesn't need to wonder about the first few frames. Okay, were they already cropped or is that where they produced right before the crop? So I'm, I'm somewhat open to that uh, idea too. So uh, Janabar here, 
I have some a um, uh, couple of points. So one is that this tab media is currently not specified. I mean, it's being discussed in the working group. So, but it's not uh, a done deal as far as an API yet. And the problem here that you seem to solve is one of over capture, and specifically only. So far, I've only heard a use case for this being for this new method that has not been defined yet. So I think it's a little premature. That's my first comment. Um, I'm also agreeing with Henrik that uh, you know, right now you're proposing a cropping tool uh, for on MediaStream Track, which would be a generic cropping tool, and then we have to think about uh, all the sources that produce MediaStream Track, like Canvas Capture, Peer Connection, uh, Element Capture, and uh, it's not clear to me how the coordinate system of a div, how that would map to those sources, or for or for a camera track even. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. if 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 uh, get if this tab media is the only source that this applies to, <clears throat> uh, having uh, this as cropping, my first comment would be then we should limit uh, it to that API, like Henrik mentioned. The Firefox has tried to add uh, constraints in the past to crop. A, uh, a speech, sorry, a speech. The uh, sorry, we got some background noise here. The um, I was going to say, we've tried constraints in the past to crop uh, the capturing of uh, uh, screen capture specifically, and it um, uh, and other things. The the question again comes with coordinate system because an application would then have to deal with these coordinates. Um, also, since this media capture hasn't been specified yet, one of the things I proposed last time was that we solve this at the point of capture. So uh, in this case, for this type media, the obvious solution to me would be that the uh, you specify this during capture, that you capture this div, basically, and don't capture everything else. And we yes. don't, then we sidestep the whole problem of uh, coordinates. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not interrupting you, am I? No, uh, I think that was my comment. Okay, so uh, as I said, you've just uh, brought up three different points. The first point is that uh, there is yet another th uh, thing that against putting it on the media stream track, and that is that it will just have to fail for media stream tracks which were obtained elsewhere. So that's a point for taking uh, Henrik's suggestion, and I agree. Uh, maybe it would be better not to put it on media stream track, but rather put it on this type media itself. I'm okay with that. Uh, the second point is that um, we have discussed previously, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you are alluding to that or not, but just for the benefit of other people, I think that we would still not want to be able to capture an HTML element to say, okay, I want to capture this div itself because uh, if parts of it are obscured, the user might be consenting to capture something he's unaware of. So sure. I think that still taking the, uh, I, I know we, we, you and I have had uh, a bit of track here, uh, record here, just for the benefit oh, of no. others. Uh, sorry, yes. I, I did put in some slides last time as well, I think, that I think you're alluding to the same mm -hmm. thing, the discussion we had, which was about, you're still capturing the viewport, but mm -hmm. you're, you're clipping it to, um, to, uh, to a, uh, an iframe or, uh, something, uh, or a div like that, so that you would only be capturing the intersection of what is already viewable for privacy reasons, but you can also then crop within that using uh, native HTML uh, things, whether they be iframes or divs or both. Uh, yes. I only mentioned iframes last time. Uh, we could probably talk about extending it to other items, but this seems, my, the overall point is that the problem here seems to be over capture in the first place. So if we, if we can solve over capture, we don't need cropping. And I think that would be better because then we don't get into coordinate systems because uh, you know, display pixels on different OSs don't even have uh, the same sizes all the time. And I can see a lot of confusion. So, I mean, why over capture and then leave it on the app to get the coordinates wrong? Because as, as you mentioned, for privacy, you don't want it to ever be wrong. And it seems better than to solve this at the capture stage. So you never capture uh, uh, privacy sensitive information in the first place. Yes. So um, what I would argue here is that uh, the user we are not going to communicate to the user that we are only capturing a div because the user is not actually in place to understand what each div uh, contains, which means that the user is going to give uh, permission to capture the entire viewport. And if he's going to do that, and in the case that an application wants to sometimes change that, 
then if the user just consented already, it would make no sense to make the application query the user for yet another consent if they want to now oh. uh, uh, sub-capture a different part. So if you capture Agreed. to begin with the entire tab, and then you you know you crop it as you wish in different times. I think that creates a better user experience. Uh, uh, well, I, I think permission is separate from this. You you get permission to the application gets permission to capture the entire page, but mm -hmm. the application also gets controls uh, to only capture a, an iframe or a part of it. And I think uh, those things are separable, at least uh, in my mind, that uh, you give the tools. Uh, in the you know, in the way you specify the capture, you say cap, uh, you have permission to to capture the whole page, but we're only going to capture a part of it, and that seems fine to me with given permissions. The well, this is also uh, related to how long permission lasts. If uh, if uh, get this tab media called again on the same page, on the same tab, doesn't cause any prompting then getting a new capture on the same from the same page with a different div is uh, trivial so why not just do that instead of changing the crop of an existing track uh, at the moment call in either get display media or get this tab media so get this tab media is going to i can hear some feedback i think it's from okay thank you very much uh so at the moment, get display media uh, queries every single time, and they think that that is even in the spec. And get this uh, spec and get this tab media is modeled after that in that it also, uh, if you query multiple times, you're going to get multiple prompts for the user. Of course, yeah, now, you wouldn't want to do that, but you already since you're capturing your own page, you can already uh, you control everything. You can relay out the div. You can do whatever you want. So it shouldn't uh, be a lack of con control surface here. Yes, and another argument that I wanted to have is that you don't necessarily, um, I, I guess you could always put everything else inside of a div. So that much at, le at least is true that you could always capture the entire. So uh, for that reason, I would be okay with also making get, uh, this get this tab media just part instead get this div media. Uh, another argument against that, and by now we're in particular, so maybe, um, but, uh, another uh, question here would be whether this could be confusing to a web developer that they think that they're capturing the div, but actually, um, like, would they understand that they're only capturing, you know, a sub portion of the uh, viewport? Well, if we're talking API ergonomics, I think other alternatives to this API uh, surface to bike shed a little bit would be if you have a method and you're, call, and you're passing in a DOM object. Just making a method on that DOM object, so you could do div dot capture stream or something like that. That would not actually be uh, usable for us because we want uh, any iframe to be able to catch any other iframe. Basically, uh, if we look at the previous one uh, use case where we said you're getting the entire uh, tab, uh, tab, which is by by the way still something that somebody like we're still pushing for that because you mm. some some people don't want sure. to crop at all, right? And if you sense. can do that then you also want to be able to crop from any place. You don't want mm -hmm. the, the cropping mechanism to be subject to you running same origin as the div. OK. OK, so then you would pass it in then, or you would have uh, two methods. Would, you would could have, have uh, media devices, two APIs for the same thing. Um, I guess that's an option, but then only one of them can crop. But I want both of them to be able to crop. Right. Mm -hmm. Like okay. my, my my work is motivated yeah. by a specific but, customer, and they sure. have their own limitations. Sure, I'm, I'm just trying to give options. We either do, you know, we could make it a method on the element, or we could pass the element in somehow as a constraint or otherwise. I guess. Uh, I'm a little confused here about we've about the same origin thing. Maybe so we, we're assuming that there are both of the origins are. Happy to collaborate. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to post message this um, crop ID from one to the other. But if they're happy to collaborate, why can't they just post message a stream? I think that streams are not serializable, and therefore you cannot post message a stream. But I could be wrong there. Uh, if, yeah, that's that's correct. 
Uh, okay. The medium stream track in this case uh, are not and, serializable. Yes, and, and same thing for giving access, mm -hmm. like you cannot say like this mm -hmm. part of the DOM, like this div, that's mm -hmm. similarly impossible. I should also clarify that since we're talking about cropping as a sub-feature of get this tab media or this tab media, uh, I don't currently think that the, since we're talking about security properties, uh, I've, I've objected to some of the security properties of the proposal. Uh, and I think it needs to be locked down with a uh, course or co-op or similar things. So I want to make sure that this isn't perceived as me agreeing to that, that API. Uh, of course not. Uh, and okay. I've also, just in case, I've not uh, received the complete green light from Chrome security either. So this is still under active discussion everywhere. Right. That's good. And I think it's it's useful that we can discuss cropping orthogonal to that. So yes. that's good. Um, <clears throat> re related to uh, your crop ID, I, I think we should have uh, a clear use case for being able to uh, one top level page wanting to only capture a given element in an iframe that is cross origin, you know, um, because it, it's adding quite some complexity to add uh, like a binary, a group ID attribute or group ID string. And if we were able to restrict that to to a, to a DOM node, like, yeah, I want to capture this iframe, then it's it's a more natural API uh, than what is proposed there. So uh, I, I'm fine going with an API which is uh, less natural, but the use case should be very clearly defined. And uh, yeah. Uh, sure, uh, if we could jump to uh, slide number 26, uh, then I can, re, uh, I can show again, uh, I think that, um, the, the the group in Google that works on this, I think their current name is uh, Google Work Group. I think they've had a public blog post, so we can talk. Uh, number 26 for me is uh, a few more up. It's the one with the, the only one with an image. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so this one is actually taken from a public post. So I we can discuss what, what we see here. And what we see here is that you have one uh, frame that runs Google Slides and one frame that runs Google Meet. And the Google Meet uh, frame is the one that needs to uh, run the capture and plug, uh, crop it and plug it into a peer connection. But the thing that it actually wants to crop to is the content of the slide. So uh, that is so what is more, sorry? It's more than the iframe then. Because, I mean, the Google yes, Slide, it's the Google it's actually slide frame, could, could could be tailored to, to just that. I mean, it's not yeah, some so, other possibility as well. I'm sorry? Well, an, another possibility would be that you have two iframes, really. Uh, one which is just about the content, and then you, you could have some controls or, I mean. Yes. Um, yeah. it's, that, that's yes, another but, possibility. But the, parent, the parent here is uh, slides, and the child here is meat. All right. OK. Yep. Well, the the child is sorry. Can you repeat that? On the left, you have the top level application. On the right, you have uh, the the iframe that needs to capture. So um, right. But so so what we would have here is the top level would just communicate with a post message and ID to the uh, to the side, and it right. would then crop. Right. But this website also contains other specific logic, like sending it over a peer connection and all that stuff. So it would probably be trivial, hopefully, to even if there's an iframe uh, for structural reasons, because there are different origins, within that iframe, you could have other iframes or smaller iframes or divs that do the job solely of dictating the the the, dimension, the extent of the capture. Yeah, that but they're, they're not, they're not, they, they're not um, you cannot reach them from the Google Meets iframe as well. Because it's quite precisely, yeah. And the, you need to the because... ah. I'm sorry. What was the question? Uh, you you guys uh, spoke at the same time. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around. So you need to reach the iframe that you're going to capture from. That would uh, be I done don't... by meet. Uh, that would that would be done by the 
the capture. It's capturing itself, right? So that should hopefully not be an issue. So me, uh, the, the part you have on the right here in this sample application uh, mm -hmm. captures everything, but then it needs to crop to the co uh, to co uh, to a, a to a DOM right. node okay. that is on a different frame that it has no access to, but a slight amount of access just in the name of uh, of the crop ID that is easily transmissible okay. between them or communicable. Well, privacy wise, that's a little more. Concerning though, wouldn't it have been safer to have the the uh, the thing being captured capture itself and uh, join uh, the, the call that way? Sure, the, the, uh, that's one option. But uh, I don't think that this is really a problem if this is an unguessable token, which uh, the application uh, that is being captured chooses to even have. Like you wouldn't have it unless they actually injected it uh, there, and then they choose to post message it. So. And also, I would argue that if not for the crop region, you would have been capturing everything. So you're, you're, if anything, you're removing content. So you're not gaining any extra information here. I want to make so a comment the, about yeah. that, right? Be because because divs can change in you know however you want. Uh, I think it's important that what is asked to be captured is actually everything, and like the the whole tab. Uh, and in that case, if you're capturing everything anyway, then I don't think we need to get into details about which iframe are we capturing, right? Because we're capturing the whole tab. Uh, and I think the uh, cropping can just be considered an optimization rather, really. Um, That's why I like we're, about, the, uh, we're about to run out of time. I'm just wondering what our... Do we have any consensus on next steps or, or where we're going from here? Uh, I think maybe the most important question is where is follow-up conversation happening on this? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit new here, so I would love it if somebody could tell me what would normally happen here. Um, so can you remind me where the get tab display media thingy is being discussed? Is it on the screen share repo right now? Or? Um, it's on the, uh, it's on. Yeah. Okay. So Thank yeah, you. maybe uh, raise an issue there where you summarize your findings and where we could continue the conversation. Of, of course, it's linked to the discussion on uh, get tab media, but uh, I think, uh, Continuing the discussion on the orthogonal bits would be useful. I'm sure I'll create an explainer and reference it, and uh, we can continue like that. Great. OK, everybody, uh, we're out of time. We did not get the bird this time. Uh, so I guess we have leftover material for the February interim. Please fill in the doodle poll so we can get a date and time uh, um, so we can meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.